just tuning in, let us know where you're tuning in from. We would love to know where all of our global audience is. Let us know, please. Um, so just to start off, if you are, if you identify as a woman or a non-binary individual who is in a mid to senior position in product and technology and looking to take your career to the next level, then you've come to the right place. So we're super excited to have you here and tuning in live. Uh, before, um, as I said, before I pass the mic over, I just want to go over some housekeeping so we're all in the same page here and we can you know ensure that we're just going to have an incredible experience here together so thank you again for joining us live uh we very much encourage your participation during this hour uh, this is a safe space to share and connect and i'll be here moderating in the background just to ensure that everything stays that way um and so i can see people tuning in from baltimore phoenix let us know let us know where you're tuning in from some ways that you can participate today is, you know, feel free to go off camera. You do not have to be picture perfect to show your face here. We'd love to see your smiling face. Uh, feel free to come off mute if you have any questions. And you can also engage in the chat. So I will be checking the chat there. And if anyone has a question that they want to pose anonymously, feel free to um, ping me in Zoom here. You'll see Sepi Rhymes with Pepe and, and you can send your question to me and I'll share that with Lisa. Oh, I see we have Argentina. Oh, we have someone else in Spain, Tosa de Mar, Spain. Uh, thanks so much for joining here. Um, this session is being recorded. And so uh, this session will actually go on our site afterwards. So if you do come off mute and you're on camera, that will be in the recording uh, for others to see. Just wanted to let you guys know that. Um, and then we will be sending you an email afterwards uh, with the link to uh, today's event in case if you want to rewatch this. Uh, keep up with us on social. If you want to keep up with all things Power to Fly, you can find us on all the social platforms at Power to Fly. Fabulous. I see Ghana is in the house also. Thank you. Welcome so much, everybody, uh, for joining us here. So I think that was all of the housekeeping. I want to ensure that you guys have a lot of time here for this fabulous workshop. So without further ado, I'm really excited here to pass the mic to our guest speaker, Lisa Kostovo from Career Climb, and she's going to be leading today's chat and learn um, on climbing the career ladder as a woman or non-binary person in tech. So Lisa, I'm going to pass it to you. And just before jumping into the, today's workshop, please feel free to tell our audience a bit more about yourself, about Career Climb, and what they can expect from today's session. Fantastic. Thank you so much, CP. This was a um, great introduction. And thank you for our global audience, those of you guys joining us live, those of you joining us via the recording. This is really for you. If you identify as a woman uh, or non-binary person and you're in tech, in technology, or you're working in another company in a tech capacity and you are mid-career. So what is mid-career? Mid-career is somebody who has at least four to five years of experience in our community at Career Climb, we actually serve uh, women or those who identify as women um, who are in those roles, in those mid-career roles, because we find that that is the part of the climb that is the most vulnerable and the most risky for women. Um, there you know, lots has been talked about the pipeline problem and that a lot of it has been, you know, addressed with like education and giving access to women um, to STEM degrees and, and giving them access to kind of those entry-level positions. My experience and my observation as somebody who's been uh, a VP of product and has climbed her career mountain in tech is actually that the problem is in the middle of that career, people dropping off before they get a chance to get to those executive levels. So that is our mission. And I'll uh, talk about a little bit about our mission, the career climb. Um, the reason why uh, the climbing analogy is because I am a climber. I'm a mountaineer and I'm very, very passionate. And I'll tell you some mountaineering stories today in our chat and how they relate to your, um, your career journey as well. So this is our mission at Career Climb. We're a coaching company. Uh, we have several programs that develop, develop female executives in that mid-career level. And our mission is to guide as many of you to the top of your career mountains because, because this is the observation. We believe that the world is a vastly better place when more tech products are created by women and people um, with different backgrounds than what we have right now in the executive ranks. 
while we recognize that the playing field is not yet even um, for us, for a lot of us, we believe that it is a matter of persevering and getting as many of us to the top, to those executive levels, so that we can break the trail and then we can establish a way forward, an easier way forward for those who come behind us. So um, we work with women in product management, program management, project management, design, business analytics. We have had women with all different backgrounds. We're still a little bit of a specialist because we haven't grown. We've only been around for less than a year, but we've already produced amazing results. Um, a lot of our women, especially in our nine month program have gotten great, um, great uh, results in terms of promotions, uh, increases in compensation, uh, ability to speak at large events in front of large audiences, huge increases in confidence. So I want you guys to know that this is possible. What we're going to talk about today is not limited to the couple of picture perfect women you may see out there who reach those high levels of their career. And you may think, well, but she's smart. She's, you know, superhuman. She works like hell. She's got opportunities. I'm not like her. I cannot do the same things as her. And I want you to know that that's not the case. In fact, climbing your career has a lot to do with climbing a mountain, with being successful at an expedition to climb the top of a mountain. It requires the same degree of planning, preparation, and is also possible for a lot more people than a few kind of extreme performers. That's the message I want you to take away. We're going to spend the first half an hour or so going through the framework I've developed based on my own career experience and based on my own experience as a mountaineer, um, working with actually one of my mentors, who is a trainer in our programs. Um, she's the first woman to climb Everest without oxygen. And she's one of the most established uh, commercial guides on Everest. So she has taught me a lot. We've developed a lot of the principles that translate over to how you guys climb your career. So it's hopefully it's going to be interesting. It's going to be engaging. We're going to tell some cool stories and then we're going to take questions. So I want to transport you back to a day in May, um, end of May, beginning of June, 2018. And I was flying in this in exactly the same airplane around the tallest mountain in North America, Denali. For those of you guys who uh, may not uh, know the name Denali, it used to be called Mount Whitney, I'm sorry, Mount McKinley, and it is the highest mountain in the continent. Um, it is very challenging to climb because it is in, uh, in addition to being kind of tall, it is also huge. And so it requires a lot of time to climb it. In addition, it is almost in the Arctic Circle, which means that it gets really, really, really cold, even in the middle of the summer, uh, which is where the short climbing window is. Anyway, I was flying around the mountain with my partner, and we had just come back from an expedition we had done in another part of Alaska, Mount Fairweather. Now, Mount Fairweather is also very challenging. It's a very uh, interesting and beautiful ma mountain. It's closer to the ocean. In fact, it's a border peak. And it, what, what it means is it's actually shared between Canada and, and the United States. And when we climbed it, we were joking that we didn't, we entered Canada without our passports because we were the first climbing team to summit that peak in two years. Um, and I'm pretty sure I'm the first person originally from Bulgaria to summit that peak. Um, but anyway, fair weather is, was a typical Alaskan expedition, lots of gear, lots of, um, lots of physical endurance, lots of kind of spending time on the glaciers and doing a huge push for summit day, but it was not 
you know, as big and as intimidating as Denali. So we're just coming back from Mount Fairweather. We're doing a tour of Alaska. We end up in the national park. We end up staying in an Airbnb with a famous airplane pilot who's actually flown a ton of climbers up on Denali. And, and especially landing on the mountain is very, very dangerous when you're a flight, uh, when you're piloting because of visibility and because of there's no runway per se. You just have to land on the snow. So we are going around, we're flying around this mountain and there's this conversation happening in the, uh, in the plane. Uh, somebody is asking the pilot, Hey, um, have you climbed the mountain? Because we were actually, as we are circling around, we're seeing, um, oops, hold on. Uh, let me just pop out real quick here. I want you to see this photo. Um, let's see if I can present it. Okay. Um, let me know if you guys are seeing this. Okay. So we are looking down on the glacier. The, the, there's this is the Kahiltna Glacier, um, and it is uh, kind of the approach. It's the first phase of an expedition. What you see down there, or maybe actually this is midway up the, uh, up the mountain towards Camp 4. What you're seeing there is these tiny little specks of of dots, like you can see them. These are rope teams. These are climbers that are connected with ropes to each other and they're, they're advancing up the mountain. And it looks so crazy. The whole landscape is so majestic and so huge. I've never seen anything like that in my life, not even on fair weather. And guys, if you haven't gone to Alaska, please go. It's honestly the last wilderness frontier i believe in the world maybe there's parts of the north of russia or north of asia to have a similar feel but it is so grand and so just wild and so here's me i'm looking down at these climbers and my 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 stomach is clenching in a knot because i am realizing that i want to climb denali <laughs> that i want to be down there climbing it right now. And I never thought of myself as a big mountain climber. Denali is considered a big mountain. Uh, it, as, I, as I mentioned, it is kind of considered a major, major expedition. And I never thought of myself as a, as a big mountain climber. And uh, somebody asked the pilot, so wait, um, have you climbed Denali? He's like, no, I'm not crazy. Look at these guys. They're insane. Um, and so the conversation keeps going. And then the same person who was asking the, the pilot, once we landed the plane, once we landed the plane um, and we are getting out of the plane, he turns around to me and he asks, so I heard you were climbing in Alaska. When are you coming here to climb Denali? And the words just came out of my mouth. I said, I'm coming back next May and I'm climbing it. And that's what happened. Um, this is what happened. I, um, this is Denali in the background. I, I spent the whole year, I declared it in front of all my friends. I hired a coach uh, who's a really good friend of mine. He has a company. He's a Patagonia ambassador, an amazing person. Hired the best person in the field to help me train, um, train to become a mule, essentially, over the course of a year. I climbed a number of other mountains to prepare for Denali. Um, and what I ended up doing is very, very similar to what you guys are doing in your career. Uh, I remember one time I saw Sheryl Sandberg in a female audience, and she the first question she asked us, she said, stand up if you've ever declared or if you've ever decided that you want to be a CEO one day. And we looked around to each other and we were so embarrassed because none of us uh, stood up. Very few of us had stood up. And it's really funny or interesting to me now because a few years down the line, down the line, here am I, a CEO of my own business, right? But I had not declared it. I had not decided it. I had not declared it. And therefore, I didn't have a path or a plan to actually do it, right? So first, you have to even the idea needs to enter your mind as a possibility, and then you need to decide that you're going to find the resources, you're going to find the time, you're going to figure it out, 
and you're going to make it happen. So that's the decision point is the first thing. Before you decide, nothing can happen. You cannot declare it. You cannot plan for it. You cannot execute it. You first have to decide it, right? So do you want to be a CEO? Do you want to be an executive? Do you want to be a head of product or a head of your function? Do you want to be a, a chief you know, blank officer, whatever your, um, your function is, chief product officer, chief design officer. So drop in the chat right now. If you guys are declaring, if you're deciding that you want to climb that summit, whatever that summit looks like for you, it could be starting your own business. It could be a CEO. It could be uh, an executive role. So drop in the chat right now. I want to, I, I want to be this person who was in the in the plane with me asking me, so when are you doing this? I'm asking right now, guys, are you doing it? Are you doing it? Are you in? Are you in? And again, this is the first step, guys. If you are willing to entertain the idea that one day you could be an executive, a CEO, a head of something, drop it in the chat. We need to know that is the first ba baby step towards that. The next step that you guys are going to have to do is declare it. And here's a tip for declarations. Declare it in front of people who support you and who believe in you. One of the best things that um, uh, the people in Career Climb in our programs, the women in our programs really, really talk about is the value of the community and the support that the community provides. Communities like Power to Fly, guys, these are super important places for you to get that support and that extra confidence and belief in yourself because without it if you declare it to somebody who is wants to keep you down and wants to sabotage you and doesn't believe in you as an insecure person do not under any circumstances declare your vision and your bold uh, bold dreams to a person like that or people like that find the people who are going to support you and believe in you and you would declare it and let them hold you accountable and finally, do. And by do, I mean, you don't just declare, okay, I'm going to be, I'm going to get a pr promotion to, let's say, a director or senior director. And you're going to have that be your New Year's resolution. And, you know, January 1st, you're pumped, you're going to, you know, get the promotion this year. And then you forget about it. And then December 30th comes around and you're like, oh, maybe, maybe I should have a conversation with my boss tomorrow <laughs> to see if, you know, if I can get promoted in a day, right? So you can't climb a mountain like Denali in a day. It just doesn't happen. You have to take all these steps. When I first saw Denali, guys, I was not anywhere near um, fit or I was not, if you had dropped me at the base, base camp of Denali, I would have like peered out. I was in no position to climb it then. But I knew I had to become the person who was able to climb it. And that was going to take daily and weekly action and planning, planning for the full year, over a year of training, and then also daily planning and daily execution on these little tiny steps. I did not go to the gym once a week for, you know, 12 hours. I did an hour to an hour and a half every day. And some days it was stretching or very low heart rate. I was wondering, I was constantly asking my, my coaches, like, are you guys sure I'm getting ready for the night? Because this seems too easy. And they're like, no, trust it. Trust it. That there's a plan. So another important thing, and we'll cover that, is to have somebody who's been there who can guide you, who can tell you, like, trust the process. There is a plan. You're advancing at the right rate. The biggest, biggest risk you guys can do is get super psyched, then try to climb the mountain in a day, try to do everything at once, and then you get the disillusion, and then you draw the wrong conclusion that you're not fit for this. You're not talented enough. You're not good enough. No, you are talented enough and good enough. You're just approaching it the wrong way. So let's see how you can approach climbing your career mountain. So the five keys to the CLIMB framework, uh, I want to walk you through each one of them. And FYI, this is actually our rope team. This is three rope teams. This is a picture I took. Uh, this is on our Fairweather expedition in Alaska. So Fairweather is a, a, exactly across 
Um, you, you, you guys can see it there. We're about to become the first team to summit in, in two years. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. There's just nothing like the exhilaration of climbing a thing like this, which includes your career as well. So the first key to the climb framework is cut the noise. Okay. So <clears throat> share in the chat if you relate with experience where you just feel overwhelmed. There's so many things that are coming your way. And if you, even if you didn't sleep, even if you didn't have a personal life, it feels like you could never catch up in the 24 hours a day. But all the things that, you know, are being asked of you are coming your way, you want to do, you think you should be doing. So that overwhelm noise, right? Realize that this is our predicament as informationally connected society. Even if you guys are doing some other function or building your own business, there's like an avalanche of noise, of requests, of ideas coming at you. And here's what happens mid-career. Um, you know, this is another climbing analogy. When we climb a mountain like Denali, it takes us about three weeks and it takes us about four to five, um, four to five um, camps, right? And as we go up, the terrain is changing. So at first we're uh, going on, relatively speaking, soft snow because it's it's more flat. It's on a glacier. Uh, the risk is different there. There's crevasses. Uh, but as you go higher up the mountain, it becomes steeper. Now the snow transitions into ice and there's fewer crevasses because we're kind of on the rock, on the slope of the mountain. And so as you transition and start keep climbing um, midway as you transition, you actually have to change your equipment. You've been climbing on snowshoes and now you got to transition and climb on crampons, which are these spiky things uh, strapped on your shoes. And if you don't transition that, you're in for a lot of pain and risk of dying because the snowshoes are going to keep sliding down and you know they're not going to get enough of a grip. Plus, it's going to be really clunky. They're big. What you need is the smallest footprint that like digs deep into the ice to keep you anchored to the side of the mountain. So what happens with a lot of us when we get to the mid-career is this, we are, um, we need, we understand we need to change our approach. We need to change our equipment to get to the next level, to operate effectively at the next level. But a lot of us default to just, putting on our snowshoes and trying to walk in them in a different terrain because we haven't yet got enough practice on our crampons. Um, and what I mean by this is oftentimes when we get an overwhelm and we're in that mid-career, we end up defaulting to like, okay, I'm just going to go back to my individual contributor skills and I'm going to dig in and do it myself and pull an all-nighter and crank it out myself because I don't know how to delegate. I don't know how to work with people. I don't know how to say no. I don't know how to um, structure my workload right now so that I'm effective, right? So recognize that this is going to happen. You're going to have an instinct to kind of default back to your old skills and stay in that individual contributor place just because you've been good at it. You've mastered it, but you need to get uncomfortable with turning with, with changing your equipment. And that means understanding how to prioritize everything that's coming your way, how to cut the noise, how to distinguish what's important and what's not important from, uh, from your perspective. So this little grid that you see on the slide is one that was used by President Eisenhower, uh, who was great at you know, understanding how to use his time. He was very effective. And then was popularized by Stephen Covey in uh, The Seven Habits of Effective People. And it is very simple. On the upper side, you have urgent versus not urgent classification. And on the rows, you have important versus not important. And what you're going to do is you're going to everything that comes your way, you're going to put it through this lens, right? And you're going to have a plan for you know, only a few things you're going to do yourself. These are the urgent and important things and important from the perspective of where you're going, right? 
if it's um, if it's um, not important but urgent, say it's something that used to be important for your old job but is no longer important from where you're going, say it's like a lower level tactical task that needs to get done, but it's urgent. Guess what? You got to have a plan to delegate it. Even if you don't have a direct team reporting to you, look around for somebody who wants to learn, look around for someone who wants to be mentored and who wants to learn to do what you've done, train them and delegate stuff to them. Yeah. They're not urgent or important. You need to have a plan for how to actually schedule it in your calendar. There's a whole session, um, you know, we can do with Power to Fly about how to prioritize your time and how to kind of delegate. Like we can do a whole session on this and I can teach you guys many, many different ways to actually accomplish this. Um, but we, we don't have the time right now. We're just going to kind of do an overview and you guys can read more about this. Um, not urgent and not important recognize those things and learn how to say no, learn how to say no in a way that makes the other person feel heard and enrolls them in understanding why you're saying no, because not because you're being difficult or being lazy. Uh, believe me, like they're not going to think that if you, if you have a conversation about like, okay, what are we going to give up or what's not going to get done or what is more important priority wise for a company? right? So learn how to do that. And my next uh, assignment to you for homework assignment is action number number one. For the next one week, look at the requests or look at the things that are coming your way and apply this framework to them and decide, even if it's uncomfortable to ask somebody else to, uh, you know, do, do this, delegate, make a plan, say like, it's not important right now. Let's, you know, uh, like two months from now, let's put down Friday afternoon. Let's, let's address it then. And let's hash it out, put it on the calendar, commit to it learn how to say no to things that are not important and not urgent, and then really commit to doing the things that are both, both important um, and urgent. And I really want you to not lose sight of the things that are important, but not urgent, because those tend to get pushed down the road and you never get to them. And this includes your own career mapping and career journey. Uh, nobody is going to look out for your career pro progression, but yourself. So you have to identify the things that are important, put them on the calendar and defend them and make sure that you follow up on those items. The second key, and one that generates a lot of emotional reactions and triggers a lot of people usually is L and that is lead. Don't be liked. I intentionally worded it this way. Um, I don't actually mean that you should be a, a disliked or you should be a disagreeable or difficult person. That's not what I mean. However, I've been frustrated beyond belief managing women on my teams and seeing this pervasive behavior everywhere that is caring more about being liked than voicing your voice and opinions. It's just that like, it's just such a preoccupation of like not disappointing someone, not saying no, because what are they going to think of me? It's just this preoccupation with being liked. And I've taken that as a mission and I've crusaded against it because even, you know, when I was ma managing teams, because it used to, it used to frustrate me to no belief. Right. So if you relate to this behavior, all of us do it to some extent, drop in the chat. Yes, this is me. I have trouble. Like I'm worried that somebody's not going to like me if I push back or if I voice my opinion. It's normal. And the first step is to have awareness of it and recognize that behavior. So what do I mean by lead don't be liked? Well, what I mean is you got to practice uh, task conflict versus personality conflict, and you got to stay in the room. Um, so there's a podcast episode of my podcast that will be uh, coming out either next week or the week after about task conflict versus personality conflict. It's a, um, it's a concept researched and developed in behavioral science by such, you know, professors like Adam Grant, etc., who have basically said, look, when we look at team effectiveness and company effectiveness, we notice that pe 
people who disagree and debate healthily and are willing to engage in differences of opinions actually arrive at better ideas and solutions and they do it faster. But, 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 but in, in situations where people are worried about how they're going to be perceived and there is this like personalization of what people say or do, and it becomes about me and not about like my ideas. And this inability to distinguish the fact that you can be a great person and people can respect you, but they can still disagree with your ideas, right? So this and the inability to pull apart your ideas from your worth as a person is actually connected with the concept of personality conflict. Personality conflict is very toxic. And even though somebody else in your team or in your company may have like a, may take things personally and have a very combative approach, you don't have to engage with that type of um, debate. You can always turn it around and you can always position it as like, let's debate about ideas. Let's put our ideas on, on the table and let's talk them through and really affirming affirming this kind of distinctions between we like each other, we respect each other. And because we like and respect each other, let's agree to disagree and let's hash out the best solutions. Look at the pros and cons, engage on the stage of just sparring of ideas is very, very important. So don't be afraid to step into the rink and have task conflict and have debates and, and ideas that like you your ideas are valuable. I've seen so many women kind of like default to that supportive role where they're like, oh, okay, we're getting together in a room and you know what? Um, you know, we need food. It's going to be a lunch meeting, a lunch brainstorm. I'm just going to go out and order some food for us. And then I'm going to go over there and get it de delivered. And the product manager, the woman leaves the room. And I'm like, what are you doing? This is not the, like, stay in the freaking room, stay in the freaking room guys, because your value is not to deliver the, the donuts and the coffee. Your value, if you want to send in your career is to debate and to be able to have, uh, have this, this separation from your personality and your worth, self-worth, your confidence and your ideas. Be willing to have your ideas taken apart. Be willing to play the devil's advocate, take somebody else's ideas apart. This is what you do when you lead, because you are going to be showing how to do task conflict versus personality conflict. And that is what a leader does. That is why I'm saying lead, don't be liked. You can still be liked, but don't focus on being liked as your first priority. Care more for being respected than being liked, and then you'll end up being liked as well. Trust me, all my career moves, uh, save for one, have been by teams who have worked with me, who have, I've engaged in a lot of heated debates with, pulling me in to their new startup or their new company because they wanted to work with me because they saw my value and they weren't uh, afraid. A lot of guys are not afraid to debate, right? And then you see them like screaming at each other, debating their ideas. And half an hour later, they're having a beer in the bar. They're not like some of us women who go back sulking to our desks and think all night through, like, what did we do wrong? And why did this person say this thing to me? And oh my God, they, they, they don't like me anymore. Anyway, you can see I'm very passionate about this. I can talk for hours about this key. Action number two, number two, I want you to engage in at least one task conflict over the next one week. If you're gonna, if you're um, in, Impulse is being to keep your mouth shut if somebody ha like pr proposes an idea, even if you disagree or have some concerns about it. Voice them, voice them. Don't be afraid to engage in debate, engage in that kind of uh, sparring of ideas. I want you to, to push yourself from position of discomfort to actually engage in debate next week over something in your work. The next key is internal customers. And internal customers, what I mean is that, um, and, and this is not so not only for product managers or people who build the product, but all of you guys, when you're working in tech, you're 
trained to look at customers as the people who are using your app, your software, whatever it is that you're building, even though you may not be in product management, you may be in a sales function or marketing function, doesn't really matter. You know, the customers are our customers. The truth is um, for you guys as a company to achieve your goals and to have a great product that moves forward and to achieve all these goals, there needs to be a lot of teamwork involved between the different departments and people inside of the company. And so I have a picture here of a soccer team, a women's soccer team, because I want you to understand that when you are an individual contributor, a lot of times you have this view, this tunnel view of the field where you're looking at who's next to you. Is the ball getting passed to you? Are you running with the ball? Who do you get to pass the ball to? But you don't have the coach's box perspective, which kind of sees the game or the playing field from a higher vantage point. And by, and you can get that perspective by engaging with curiosity, re reading up about, you know, your company, your industry, asking really cool, clarifying questions to the executives, engaging in conversations with some of the people that are sitting on those high level um, box boxes, coaches box and have that view, right? You want to be curious about how the strategy is unfolding. What is the strategy behind our our execution, you know, why are we doing this? And what's the goal or what is the vision or how are we thinking about this? And once you start understanding that, what you're going to understand is that your role is not just to run with the ball and score a goal and not pass it to anyone. You're going to understand, aha, okay, we know that in this configuration, this, um, this, you know, these couple of players are going to come in here and they're going to be, they're going to be positioned well to take the ball over. So my goal would be to make sure that they're protected or they're in a position to get there, right? That means I pull back. I don't get the ball, but I help them. I block somebody else on the competitive team from getting to them, preventing them from taking their position. I'm going to do that, right? So this is understanding that your customers are also the people inside of the company who you get to understand what the pro problems and challenges are and find ways to pass the ball to them or support them or block somebody else from preventing them from achieving their goal. A lot of times, especially if you are in quote unquote in charge of a piece of the roadmap, if you're in product management, this has really drastic implications because a lot of times product managers are so protective of their pipeline. They're like, we're not gonna do anything that doesn't directly impact the customer. You know what? You got to. Um, I'll give you an example. So um, one of the startups where I was heading product, um, you know, I saw this was an observation that I saw our CFO was standing behind, uh, staying behind every day and cranking on uh, on the spreadsheet. And I knew a board meeting was coming up and I just talked to him and he said, you know, at least I'm trying to get this 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 data. I'm trying to put together these um, pieces of information that we have from our dashboards to get these types of, of metrics. And I have to do like three or four different spreadsheets and calculate them manually. So I took a look at what he was doing and I could see that we could automate that for him. And we included that actually as a low hanging fruit in one of our sprints and one of our engineering design sprints in the following month. And when he had that, all of a sudden he was free to go and actually do a lot more higher level things as a CFO. And he was a huge fan of, of me and of us as a product team. And I know he was like one of my biggest supporters uh, on the executive team uh, and someone who really uh, played team with us as a product organization as well. So this is going to win your friends. This is going to win you alliances. You're going to be seen as somebody who understands the bigger picture, this, the strategic roadmap of the company. Uh, even if there's chaos and there's no like plan beyond the next year, that's fine too. That is information because you're going to be able to get yourself out of that company. But when you go interview at the next place, you're going to be able to give them the coach's box perspective, which means you weren't just this individual contributor heads down was only like pass, being passed the ball and you were passing the ball, but you were actually proactively 
understanding what was going on at a higher level in the company. And that makes you higher level. That makes you more senior. So action number, uh, action item number three is write down the stakeholders that you interface with in your role, in your function, in your company, and go and have a conversation with them, a listening tour, I call it. Uh, schedule at least you know, one call with an internal stakeholder in the next week where you're going to sit down and ask them what their problems and challenges are. What is keeping them up at night? Don't promise to help or, or, you know, or assist, just listen. And then let those ideas percolate in your mind and see if you can find easy ways to help them solve their problems, right? So serve an internal customer next week. That is your action item. Number four, key number four is master your craft. So here's a picture of actually a picture that I took of our two of our rope teams, Star Expedition on Denali. We have just packed everything up. We've been flown on the Cahilton Glacier on the landing strip. We are, you know, um, roped up and ready. We're, we're on our way to Camp One on the glacier. And you can see that um, there's a lot of ropes going on here. There's like we are harnessed. We have ice axes, we have like, um, we have ski poles, we have um, avalanche, you know, we have like avalanche equipment, we have like, um, uh, you know, um, what, what, what do you call those things? Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm blanking right now, but there's a lot of stuff going on here. And on top of having about 70 pounds or so of gear on our back, on our back, we also have the sleds that carry anywhere between 40 and 60 pounds each. So this is the beginning of the expedition. We have all the fuel, all the food, everything that we're going to need for the next three weeks and where we're going. But the interesting uh, thing, the, the, the thing I want you to understand is that your craft is going to change. As I mentioned earlier, halfway up the mountain, we're actually going to look very different. We're going to store away our sleds and we're going to put on crampons instead of the snowshoes that we are uh, we have here. So understand that your craft is going to change with your evolution and with your uh, evolution of responsibilities, where you want to go next, uh, your environment, the company's evolution, and keeping understanding what you need to master next, right? Uh, so I want you guys to avoid the comfort zone of doing the things that you've already mastered, right? Get practice, start stretching into areas that are not comfortable to you. So if you are uncomfortable managing a team, a person, start with an informal mentoring of somebody in the company who wants to learn what it is to be in your function. You know, get an intern or manage an intern for a little bit, right? You don't, you are never going to be competent before you start practicing this new skill. So don't expect, don't wait for the magic to happen. It's never going to happen until you start practicing it, right? If you are afraid of public speaking, um, do it. It's going to terrify you first, but do it in smaller audiences, stretch, use your voice. We work a lot on voice in career climb pro programs. We even have an acting and improv coach, but um, I'm an, I'm an example of this. When you guys see me present right now, you would not have believed like, or probably you won't believe me when I tell you that I suffered from huge anxiety to speak because I had childhood stutter that still persists. I still stutter at times. There are some words that are difficult for me to say. And yet, you know, I've been doing this. I've been speaking for years now. I have my own podcast, Female Tech Exec, check it out. But it is a matter of just practice, 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 right? And you will get better at it. So Evolve your craft, master your craft, and really understand what is that next level skill that you get to start practicing so that you get to that next level. You're not getting to the summit of Denali on snowshoes. Action number, uh, action item number four, homework for next week is identify a skill that you know is required of you to the, reach the next level of your career and start find ways to practice it practice it, start practicing it. If it means you got to learn something, sign up for courses, but guys, please don't just be 
consuming information and laying back and thinking that somehow you're going to learn it this way. You learn by doing. You don't learn to ride a bike by reading a manual about riding bikes. Read a few pointers and then go and implement, right? This is why I have action items here for every single piece that I'm teaching you, because I don't want you guys to store this away as like information. This is practical application. Final and my favorite key is be mentored and become a mentor. This is a virtuous circle, guys. As you climb in your career, you're going to find mentors. And let me give you a piece of distinction because I saw a question about what if I can't find a mentor? What if nobody wants to be my mentor? Um, the difference between a coach and a mentor is you normally hire a coach, you pay a coach, but you establish a relationship with a mentor and mentorship develops organically. Please don't go to somebody and asking the, and ask them like cold if they want to be your mentor. Engage with somebody, find ways to add value to that person, and then let the mentoring relationship develop organically. And believe me, as somebody who is a mentor right now, I can tell you that the biggest satisfaction a mentor gets is with a mentee is curious, and they're also applying what you are advising them to do. If a mentee is just like shaking you down like a pear tree for information and then coming back to you next month and being like shaking you down for more information and you ask them like, wait a second, did you actually do the things I told you to try? They're like, no, I didn't have time, but you know, I'm going to come and ask you for, for more advice or more information. You're not respecting, you're not honoring this person's experience and their ability to know what will take for you to get to the next level. A lot of times mentors will give you tough love. They'll tell you to do things that are not comfortable or that you may not want to be doing. Do them, do them. And then with your expanding responsibility, expanding power, there will come a time where you guys will turn around and start doing the same. Because as I mentioned, we're setting, we're breaking trail on the mountain for a lot of women, for a lot of people, minorities, non-binary people who need that trail broken for them to have an easier time. And so don't be like those celebrity um, tech professionals who are, have a perfect image, who everything's polished. They're superhuman. I know uh, one of them, she's a friend of mine. And let me tell you behind that glossy exterior, everything's perfect, superhuman. She's like, you know, a CEO of a major kind of growth company right now. Behind that is a person whose health is falling apart, who the doctors can't figure out what's wrong with her, but she doesn't show that part. And if she did, she would be more relatable because People will say, wow, she was able to do this while at the same time battling this health issue. That means I can do it too. So when you guys reach your top or your summit, become a mentor, be relatable, show the paths that was difficult for you or the parts that were challenging and the mistakes that you made. This is all part of the learning process so that people can see themselves in you, right? So um, your task for the next, um, let's see if this is going, is this ever, oh, well, I skipped the action item. Action item number five was um, start a conversation with someone who you admire. Uh, it may not be an explicit mentorship conversation, but be curious, understand that person, what they went through and how they got there, where they, how they got where they got. One of my mentors, Lydia Brady, I mentioned this, the first woman to climb Everest without oxygen. She, um, she and I climbed together in a small group and I had a copy of her book at the time we were in New Zealand. She's a Kiwi and we were in this hut and my bunk was, or my, my kind of cot was right next to hers. And so I would read her book and I would turn around and I was very careful not to take too much of her time because she also needs, she has very little time to rest she's very busy on an, you know, on a trip like that, I would turn around and I would ask her like, Lydia, what happened here? Like, how, how did you feel 
when when this thing happened, uh, there's going to be a Hollywood movie made about her because her landmark ascent was disputed by her male colleague um, team team members. It was a huge scandal in the media, and so I was just curious. I wanted to know. You know, I didn't have my sights set on her becoming my mentor. I just wanted to learn as much as possible from her. Now she works with us in career climb as a as a mindset trainer, and she is someone who quotes me like she quotes me and she admires me. And this is a relationship you guys want to build. You may be a different level of proficiency on your journey, but there needs to be a mutual admiration and a mutual kind of respect between a mentor and a mentee, right? That's how you develop it. And I lastly want to invite you to join us on the next product VP challenge. Again, you don't have to be in product, but in a related area in tech is fine. You're mid-career, join us. We're starting September 6th. It's going to be free. It's a free experience where you're going to learn every day from me, uh, your peers. Lydia Brady is going to be there. We have Austin Brzezinski, who is the head of talent uh, at a major venture capital firm. He placed all the heads of product at Uber, Airbnb, and all these companies. He's the person to know in the Valley. And so all these Yes, actually, it's going to be someone who's taking his role right now. Austin is going to, you know, be with us at a, at a later stage. But anyway, this is an invitation for you guys. Just get get yourself on our email list by registering at productvpchallenge.com. If you can't attend the sessions live, they'll be recorded and made available to you for the week during the challenge, during which the challenge is uh, going on. So. I went a little bit longer than expected, but I want to open it up for questions right now. And hopefully I've managed to answer most of the questions that were submitted ahead of time with respect to the career climb framework. Fabulous. I'll just hop on real quick. Lisa, virtual round of applause. Thank you so much for this informative session. And yes, I do want to leave it open since we have a few minutes here. If anyone out there has any questions, feel free to come off your camera, come off mute and ask if you're not comfortable or you don't, if today is not a camera day, feel free to drop your questions in the chat. That's okay as well. I'm sure you have some questions out there. So this is your opportunity to ask Lisa personally and get her insight and her advice and expertise. So don't be shy. If anyone has a question, please just hop off um, mute and let us know. <clears throat> don't be shy. Also, you guys can use the, um, the chat box as well to ask any questions. We had a lot of questions that were submitted beforehand um, that, as Lisa mentioned, she had kind of gone over during um, the, the slide, the questions that were relevant, she addressed those there, but just want to leave it open here in case if anyone has any questions, <clears throat> feel free to ask. We have a few minutes left. And I promise I don't bite. <laughs> <laughs> That, that last photo of me that I showed guys was with the flag of my home country um, on the top of Denali. And I just wanted to leave you guys with this. You can do it. You can do much more than your current mind thinks you can do. You just need to decide, declare, and make a plan for it. So I want to hear from some of you. I see that there's a number of you guys who are declaring things in the chat. Why don't you unmute yourself if you declared, a this, if you decided something during to today's session. And I want to hear what that is. Use this as an opportunity to declare it. Let's take that next step, dec declaring your decisions. Who wants to go? Definitely. Don't make me volunteer, volunteer, <laughs> volunteer you. Right, I, I see the names of the tell if, if there isn't a brave soul. So believe me, it's a bit nervous. But, you know, it's okay to be n nervous, but it's, this is a supportive environment. Definitely. And it's very empowering to vocalize um, things. It's one thing to, you know, have it in your mind to write it down, but to vocalize it in front of a group of people really brings some, some energy to that. So don't be afraid or, you know, even be afraid and still um, share here with the group. So I'm going to go on mute for a second to give anyone an opportunity to share if they'd like. Or share whatever your takeaway was from today's session. Again, it's important, guys. I want you to use your voice. 
your voice, your physical apparatus also needs to be used. It's all connected. So take an opportunity to use your voice here. Promise we won't bite. I'll share here what, and, until, let's see if anybody else would like to share, but I really love talking about the, the lead, don't be liked. I think that's something that I've definitely struggled with, wanting to be liked, um, and I've held myself back um, when, you know, in hindsight, I wish I would have spoke up or I wish I would have shared an idea. I wish I would have kind of stood up for myself and pushed back, but I was too afraid to be seen as difficult or create an awkward conversation. So I just love that. That was something that you highlighted there. Cause I think it's so important, especially as women, um, you know, I think from a young age, many of us are ingrained, like to be liked and, you know, to please people and to kind of, um, create comfortable situations. But in the business world, we really need to advocate for ourselves and use the power of our voice and not be afraid um, to do that in, in groups. Hi, I just came on to first say thank you so much. Every part of it, the way you roped in the, the climbing, everything was just amazing. But I feel like my two key takeaways were one, actually having a plan to delegate some of that work, like get an intern that can do some of that for you to open space for like your purpose work. That is one thing. And also the mentorship piece. I think that is so important, especially the tips on how to cultivate a mentor and not kind of this, you know, this really organic relationship between two people who respect each other. So thank you so much. I'm so excited. I cannot wait to hear about your next mountain, your big climb. Yeah, and totally joy. join us. Uh, uh, my next climb is happening the week of September 6th and it's called the Product v VP Challenge. So even if you're not in product management, join us. It'll be fun. Thank you. Yes, thanks hi. so much for sharing, Yasmin. Oh, Kalpa, going to give the mic to you. Yeah, I was just going to say hi, Lisa. Good to see you. I've, I, I stumbled upon Lisa probably a few months ago and kind of gone through the challenge. And today, like, I literally still couldn't she didn't invite me, but I found out and I still like any every hour that I spend with Lisa is like full of inspiration. So specifically, um, I still learned something new. You reminded me um, about, you know, being mentored and becoming a mentor and, and not just like being mentor because I have made all those mistakes, you know, like gone out and say, hey, would you be a mentor? Because there wasn't anybody telling me like, hey, you know, like you, you got to, you know, mentor others. Right. But um, over the years, like that's been one of the um, powerful relationships that I've had, like where I have purposefully gone out to women that I respect and also acknowledging the power and craft that I have to share with them to, you know, really have a symbiotic kind of relationship and then and then paying it forward, right, sharing that knowledge. So I think um, all of those points kind of, again, kind of came to my mind as you were sharing. So thank you. And Kafa is a member of our career climb community. So Kafa, you're always invited. You know that you can, you can always go back and take the, the, the challenge again. You know, this is, um, it's, it's great. You know, I, I, I find that there's an addictive quality when, when, when people come into our programs and they get to connect with each other in the community and they're like, get so excited. And then you see them everywhere. Thank you for being here, Kafa. It's, it's always such a pleasure to interact with you. All right. Well, I think we are at time here. So once again, Lisa, thank you so much for your time and sharing your knowledge. And also thanks to everyone who joined us live today. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day to come join us. You will be receiving an email with a link to today's uh, session so you can uh, watch the replay there. And um, uh, we're just really happy that you joined us. So Lisa, thank you once again. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I'll see you guys, hopefully, uh, all of you on the Product BP Challenge on September 6th. Bye, guys. Fabulous. Goodbye, everyone. And if you enjoyed this chat and are interested in uh, future chat learns at Power to Fly, I dropped the link in the chat where you can see all of our calendar of events to see all of our upcoming chat and learns. Thank you all for joining. Bye.